Hello, will you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Richard. Uh, I'm the Foundation Field Geologist here in Visco, Bosnian Valley of the Pyramids. Um, I come from the UK and I've been working on this project directly and indirectly for the last 10 years. Your educational background? So originally I studied geology uh, to enter into the hydrocarbon industry and then I changed my direction and went on to study uh, geology, sedimentology and paleobiology. Why? Um, paleobiology, I suppose there is some synchronicities there with archaeology, very minor, but uh, there is some small overlap. Um, it's very difficult for a geologist in academia to go straight into archaeology. Um, I did attempt it and I was laughed out of the room uh, with the interview when I started to say that the builders of megalithic sites like Stonehenge, for example, uh, were in their own way geologists and uh, the archaeology professor kind of laughed at me. Um, so yeah, I focused on geology with the paleobiology for some crossover. What was the name of the university that uh, you obtained your degree? So originally I was at the University of Leeds and then I completed my studies at the University of Leicester in the UK. So how would you judge the study of geology over there? You were happy with that? I mean, it's, they are the most prestigious universities in the world to study uh, geology. Um, the, the field of geology was invented by uh, people living in the United Kingdom. So yes, it is high quality. However, when it comes to out of the box thinking, um, it's the same in any field of subject, uh, field of study uh, in academia these days. Um, they're very narrow. And if you try and look outside the box, you kind of get criticized for doing that. So how does the young man feel when uh, listening professors who are not really ready to allow different way of thinking. It's frustrating. And they um, still need to pass the exam. Yeah, it's frustrating. I mean, from one perspective, these professors, in order to maintain their position at universities, they have to publish a certain number of times a year in prestigious um, publications. and. Um, so they spend a lot of time studying in those areas that will get published. Um, they're not going to spend their time studying something that won't get published because then if they don't get published, they'll be out of a job. So really, it's not really the professor's faults. It's the system that they're operating in that is hindering um, out of the box kind of fields of study. During the years of your uh, study, you already had experience with the Bosnian pyramids. So do you think that uh, your college years helped you to understand what's happening here better? Um, in some ways, yes, and in other ways, no. Um, I actually read more books when I wasn't at university than when I was. Um, certainly, um, when it comes to the practical application of geology, the field work, absolutely. Um, you need to go into academia to really be taught by other people that are experts in those fields. Um, but when it comes to reading books, there's no limitation there. Inside of university, outside of university, we all have access to the same books. Um, so, yeah, there is some positives to it, but also there are, if you don't study outside of the curriculum, you're going to limit yourself. Let's go back to the time when you first came here. What made you come to the Bosnian Pyramid site? So I'd recently come back from a trip uh, to the Egyptian pyramids and um, I'd read some books before. That, that was when? 2010? This was in 2010, January in 2010. I'd read some books on alternative theories of the pyramids, uh, one in particular by uh, an author called Ralph Ellis. He touched on some of the geological observations of the pyramids. And obviously coming from that background, I was able to 
um, see it for myself, you know, because if what he was pointing out was correct, then that changes the paradigm, at least the paradigm I was living in. Um, and sure enough, I went to uh, the pyramids in Egypt and what Ralph Ellis was saying about some of the erosion patterns on the Sphinx and on the, the stones beneath the casing stones of the pyramids indicated that they are older than Egyptology says. So when I got returned back to the UK from that trip, I was doing some research and uh, 10 years ago, the Google algorithms were a little bit different to the are today. And um, I just randomly came across a picture of the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun on Google Images. And I looked at this picture and it kind of made sense from an alternative perspective of pyramids around the world. Why wouldn't there be giant pyramids in Bosnia? There's pyramids all over the world, in China, in North Korea, in Russia perhaps, Italy, France, obviously all over the South American continent. So why not Europe as well? Um, so when I saw these pictures and then did a little bit of research online, um, just like the Egyptian pyramids, I needed to go and see it for myself. You know, you can't take anything for granted on the internet, you know, whether it's for something or against something. It's best to do your own research and find out for yourself. And because I have some academic background in that field, I was well equipped um, to do those investigations. So in 2010, I originally planned to come for one month. It was the first year of uh, the volunteering programme and I was down for two shifts um, back in June of 2010. And uh, after one month of being here and experiencing the place, I had more questions than answers. And I went back to the UK. I was there for maybe two or three weeks. And for the rest of the summer, I came back to Bosnia and spent the rest of the volunteering season here conducting the excavations. What did you find here? I mean, how did it look like? The atmosphere, people, methods, work? Okay, so the Bosnian people, amazing. Um, obviously, they're, they're a big reason why I came back in the first place. Um, not just the pyramids, but the whole atmosphere. But when we're talking about the project itself, how it's come along in the 10 years since I first came here, it's, it's incredible, really. Um, outside the Ravna tunnels there was not even a bench. We actually put one of the first benches there in 2010. There was maybe one stall selling some small trinkets and souvenirs and when we come to the Ravna tunnels now we've got a whole uh, souvenir alley of buildings uh, with local craftsmen selling their wares and um, we have now thousands upon thousands of people, well, not right now because of the situation, but usually we have thousands and thousands of people coming. Whereas in 2010, most of the visitors were the volunteers themselves. We were able to work in the tunnels undisturbed for most of the day. And now it's almost impossible to work without someone disturbing, coming and having a look. Uh, film crews, documentary people, newscasters. Uh, so it's buzzing, completely different from what it was 10 years ago. What were you doing in the tunnels then? In the tunnels in 2010 we were excavating uh, the blocked up passages. So the Ravda tunnels, if you don't know, um, they're about uh, two and a half kilometres away from the Pyramid of the Sun. And um, they've been filled up at some point in the past with loose uh, rubble. And so the job of the foundation with the help of the volunteers has since 2006 has been to empty out that loose material from the tunnels, revealing more of the passages. So it's been 10 years now and uh, you are becoming more and more involved and right now you are full time field geologist. So as far as your fulfillment of your life um, goals, how does it fit in, um, in well, there? If someone had come to me and told me 10 years ago that I would be working on some giant mysterious pyramids in Europe, I probably wouldn't have believed them. But um, now that I'm here, I feel very fulfilled with what I'm doing. Um, it's something very positive. 
when I look at the state of the hydrocarbon industry, had I gone into that as a geologist, my life would be very different. And uh, I've absolutely been going out of my head right now with uh, the price of oil being what it is. Um, whereas here, I see, you know, this is, this is obviously much bigger than any of us that are working on this project. And it represents uh, a new way of thinking, a new paradigm in how we look at ourselves, uh, where we came from, and inevitably where we're going to go. Now you have met a lot of people here. For example, volunteers from six continents. You feel this is something rather new in this field of human endeavor to have so many volunteers, different backgrounds? Well, absolutely. I mean, if you look at how the uh, Egyptian pyramids have been excavated, it's a very elitist area. Um, anyone from the street just can't go and excavate a pyramid. Back when they were first being excavated, um, let's say uh, in the 1800s, not the first time, but one of the most recent times, in the 1800s, you'd have to be uh, at the top of your field to be invited to study these uh, monuments. Whereas here, the accessibility is like no other archaeological site in the world. Certainly, um, I wouldn't have been able to start excavating um, the pyramids of Egypt 10 years ago. I was able to have a look at them, but that's all. Um, here in Bosnia, uh, the volunteers are all able to contribute in their own way. Sometimes we have engineers, space engineers, for example. Sometimes we have chefs and they all share some things in common. You know, they all have questions. Uh, they're all aware that history as we've been given at school is incorrect. Um, everyone has their own ideas, how it can be corrected, but um, we all share the curiosity. And so this is a great place for people to come to find answers, not just about pyramids, but uh, about many of life's mysteries, um, because everyone's coming here with their own perspectives and it's a kind of hub for people to share their knowledge uh, in alternative ways of thinking. When you go to different archaeological sites, it's very tough really to find someone to talk to, archaeologists, or project managers, or even workers. Always they surround themselves with some type of confidentiality. How about the interaction here in Bosnia? So, when we say this is the most open archaeological project in the world, it genuinely is, because the people that are working uh, day by day on these sites are available for visitors to come and ask us questions. Uh, I would absolutely welcome anybody to come and ask me a well-informed question about what we're doing here. Um, even less informed questions, um, you know, we, we get all kinds of questions, all different kinds of theories. Some of them have merit, others don't. But the point is that we can discuss this and uh, come to a sort of common agreement about what's going on here. In the last year, you have authored three rather big and complex studies about the Bosnian Pyramid Project. One was related to the geometry elements of sacred geometry. Tell us more. So, first of all, one of the most sort of obvious um, sort of clues to the artificiality of the Bosnian pyramids is the equilateral triangle between the three largest pyramids, the sun, moon and the dragon. So this is an equilateral triangle, equal sides, 60 degree internal angles. And the equilateral triangle is used symbolically throughout history. Different cultures have used this shape. But this is just the, the beginning. It's not even the beginning of sacred geometry. The this beginning of sacred geometry is the Vesica Pisces, the two circles intersecting with each other. And we actually find not just the equilateral triangle, but the Vesica Pisces here between the pyramids and the sort of peaks of the hills, the named hills we'll call them, um, in the valley. And we will see that 
there are actually many linear alignments and geometric alignments between the pyramids and the, the other topographic spot heights in the valley. Now some people could uh, attribute that to pure coincidence, but if you look at other megalithic sites around the world, they all share some similarities in the geometry. The Great Pyramids of Giza, for example, um, you have Stonehenge and Averyhenge uh, in the UK, um, sites in South America. There's actually a few sites that repeat the equilateral triangle. Um, so it's not just here in Bosnia. So this alludes to the fact that there is some intelligent design behind the Pyramid Valley. The problem that we have, and why many people find it difficult to get their heads around it, is the sheer scale of, of the sites here. They really are monumentally huge compared to any other areas, um, megalithic sites in the world, that are so far accepted. Two major numbers in sacred geometry are the numbers pi, 3.14, and phi, or golden section, 1.618. The second one you were able to locate here at the Bosnian Valley of the Pyramids. Mm. So yeah, if we take the, uh, the peak of the Pyramid of the Sun and the adjacent pyramid, uh, the Pyramid of Love, which isn't talked about so much compared to the other three, Sun, Moon and Dragon, because it's not orientated perfectly to the cardinal points like the other three, north, south, east and west. Actually, uh, quite meaningfully, in fact, the Pyramid of Love is offset to 60 degrees. So if you take the uh, distance between, it's all a ratio, it's not exact numbers, but if you take the distance between the Sun and Love Pyramid, and you take the distance between the two highest peaks in the Pyramid Valley, which are adjacent to the Sun and Love Pyramids, Kurtnitsa and Chetnitsa. You take those two distances and you will find that those two distances are in ratio to each other according to the golden ratio. And there's some more underlying geometry. For example, if you build the two Vesica Pisces on those four spots, uh, the Sun and Love, Kurtnitsa, Chetnitsa, you'll see that the geometric pattern that's created is there's also a, a bisecting line orientated at 60 degrees. And then if you take um, the, the Vesica Pisces between the Sun and Love and build that out to be a seed of life, you will find that that seed of life then it intersects with the same uh, circle that goes around the equilateral triangle of the Sun, Moon and Dragon. So again, it's very difficult for me at least to attribute that to being a coincidence. Right now we are in the park Ravne 2, where entrances to Ravne, Ravne 2, Ravne 3, Ravne 4 healing tunnels are located. If we get to the equation in another location, which is known under the name Vratnica Tumulus, the length from here to the Vratnica tumulus and the length from the top of the sun to tumulus are basically the same. So you're getting another triangle. Mm -hmm. This one is an isosceles triangle. Um, not quite as symbolic as an equilateral triangle, but it is repeated. <laughs> In many symbolic um, things through cultures as well. So the, if I will insert a map uh, here and we can see there are so many um, alignments within the Pyramid Valley as I was saying it, it cannot be a coincidence. I mean I challenge anyone to take a topographic map and first of all find a concentration of hills, as many as there are here, that are four-sided and orientated north, south, east, west. Just find that for starters. And if you do manage to find some hills in that kind of configuration, then try and find some alignments with the surrounding hills that are in straight lines or in the ratio of phi, for example. I doubt you will find that, unless, of course, you're looking at another mysterious sacred site. In uh, Wikipedia, 
when they try to label us, the only explanation for the Bosnian pyramids that they can find is they remind them on uh, flat irons or flat irons. These are the type of the mountains. You can uh, see them in uh, Colorado. Mm -hmm. Do you have your opinion on... similarities between the two? What I would ask any geologist is how have they come to this conclusion? What geological maps are they using? Um, because as in the 10 years that I've been here, I have not been aware of any geologists being here to conduct their mapping. And if you actually look at the collected data for the latest geological maps, there is no measurements done on the vast majority of the area on the pyramids. They're always measured away from the pyramids. Now this could be just for the fact that there was no exposure on the pyramids and it's only been since the foundation has started excavating to reveal the surface of the pyramids that we're able to make those measurements. So it could just be that fact alone or it could be uh, suspicious that they've actually deliberately avoided to make any measurements on the pyramids and create their maps just from measurements around the pyramids. But um, if people, geologists in particular, came here and attempted to create a new geological map with the new exposures that we have created from our excavations, you will see that the models that Wikipedia and the like are presenting are, are not correct. They don't make any sense. Uh, and so I challenge any geologist who wants to criticise this project to come here and make some more measurements and try and give us a model other than flatter runs because it's, it's, not, it's not working. During the winter 2019-2020, you were actively involved in uh, topographic and geodesical measurements of the Ravne complex. Mm -hmm. Tell us more. So we used a uh, total station, which is uh, a precision optical measuring device. It measures angles in the horizontal and vertical planes, and it also has uh, a distant measurement unit on it. So it fires pulse light at a reflective prism, and then we can determine the distance between the total station and the prism. And uh, we were using this technique in a breadcrumb fashion to map out uh, the Raven Tunnels complex. So because of the complexity of the tunnels, it's uh, a very time consuming job. And we were operating on an accuracy of less than 10 centimeters. Um, so it was highly accurate. Uh, and in total, we mapped, um, well, the Ravna Tunnels, the original tunnels, which started excavating in 2006, their total excavated length is just over 1.8 kilometers. Um, so inside the Ravna tunnels, we have um, about 161 side tunnels that aren't excavated yet. So if we were to excavate every single passage, we already know that the tunnel network will be far longer than 1.8 kilometers. So if we just have a look at this map here, this is, this is the Ravna tunnels. Um, these here are the side tunnels and um, there, as I say there's 161 of these junction points. Here in this 10 metre section alone there are 11 side tunnels. Some of these side tunnels have drywall constructions. Presently there's 49 present in various places of the tunnels. The other interesting um, point on these tunnels is the channelised water sections which we have here. This section is over 200 metres. Um, and we find that in the middle of the passage is a square cut channel um, completely filled with crystal water, crystal clear water. So one of the reasons why we mapped uh, the tunnels with the accuracy, first of all, to see where we're digging, uh, which direction and what will be underneath us, uh, above us, I should say, on the surface. So we overlay this with a topographic map and we can see the features above us. 
but also it's important to see if there's any design parameters you know why were these passages dug in such a way are we seeing a pattern in the way that they've been dug now for me personally we see that we have a high concentration of side tunnels in this area so this area here there was definitely a focus point within the Ravna tunnels as we come further south the tunnels um, seem to become less complex although just as windy okay that was about Ravne tunnels now during the 2018-2019 seasons again you were very actively involved in the excavation of Ravne 3 tunnels what is Ravne 3? So the Ravna 3 tunnels were found, uh, as you say, in 2018 on the opposing side of the valley from where the Ravna tunnels Which are. Which is exactly there. Yeah. Okay. So we were looking to see if the extent of the Ravna tunnels extended on the other side of the valley. So we have two theories really that can potentially be correct. Number one, that someone dug a set of tunnels on one side of the valley and then a set of tunnels on the other side of the valley, or because of the extreme age of the tunnels, as we found from various uh, dates that we've obtained, which we can discuss in a moment, perhaps the tunnel network existed prior to the valley. And the incision of the valley actually destroyed a section of tunnels, therefore disconnecting the Ravna tunnels with the Ravna 3 tunnels. So that is a potential. And actually we see from um, the state of the Ravna 3 tunnels, if we look at this map here, these uh, hashed areas are quite cavernous areas that, that have been blocked up. But this whole section is open and it looks like um, this the conglomerate which is the rock the tunnels go through has actually been undercut uh, by the water that has incised the valley so this is why these sections of the tunnels are quite disturbed um, and they don't look the same as the sections deeper into the deposit so it could be that these sections have been damaged by that torrent of water that came down and eroded the valley away so the Ravna 3 tunnels, um, obviously we only discovered them in 2018, so the extent is much less than the Ravna tunnels. Uh, we have about 176 metres of tunnels excavated here, and whereas there's 161 side tunnels in the Ravna tunnels, we only have 13 side tunnels here in, in Ravna 3. Um, and so far we've discovered two dry walls as well. Now what's interesting about the dry walls is that... Above the dry walls, we wrote, this is a piece of one of the stalagmites that we excavated. And these were growing on top of the dry walls, stratigraphically. And the first date that we obtained from where we did one date with radiocarbon dating. Um, but that can be quite inaccurate, especially when we're dealing with uh, carbonates. So we opted to use the uranium thorium radiometric dating, and that got us an age of around about 6,000 years. So what this tells us is that the tunnels absolutely are older than 6,000 years because obviously there needs to be a hollow space underground for a stalagmite to form in the first place. But because this stalagmite was forming on top of the stratigraphy um, that was above the dry walls, it means that the dry walls are also much older than the stalagmite. So this again brings us more questions than answers. Um, and the first dating produced which date? The the carbon dating was I think something like twenty six thousand years. Uh, the problem with carbon date carbon fourteen dating is that you will be dating some of the dead carbon that is included in the rock that the tunnels are cut into. So the, the, the age is diluted. So it gives us an older age than what it actually is. Um, so the uranium thorium 
for this application at least, uh, of dating stalagmites is, is the preferred. If we're talking about dating of bone or wood, things like that, then carbon-14 may be uh, the way to go. So yeah, uh, Ravna 3, very interesting. We found, the so the two drywalls inside there, when we found them at the end of one of the exca 2019 excavation season, it was these objects, the two drywalls, that categorically linked the Ravna tunnels with the Ravna 3 tunnels because they were built the same way. Whoever had put the drywalls in Ravna tunnels had also done the same thing in Ravna 3 tunnels. And then when we discovered uh, Ravna 4 tunnels um, with drywalls inside, this also categorically linked all three. So Ravna 4, this was discover, discovered at the end of uh, 2019, uh, in December time, and we only have about 76 metres. Interestingly, this section of the tunnels was almost entirely open when we found it. There wasn't actually much need to excavate to enter into these passages. Obviously the front bit was buried, but once we got inside the first chamber, we were able to freely access until this end point here, which again, just like all the other tunnels in Ravna has been blocked up. So when we start digging again, uh, when volunteers hopefully start returning to the Bosnian Valley of the Pyramids, this will be a certain point of interest because first of all, it's on the opposite side to the Ravna tunnels. We want to see how how far it goes on the other side of the valley, but also it's the most southern extent of the Ravna tunnels complex. So this may be uh, one of the most efficient ways to reach uh, subterranean access of the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun, which is part of the reason why we're excavating these tunnels in the first place. Artifacts discovered? So yeah, Ravna 3 was uh, a real nice find for the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun Foundation. Um, the foundation's field archaeologist, Anna Agic, she um, identified in the floor of one of the first chambers of the Ravna 3 tunnels uh, pottery. Uh, and so we removed the raised floor, which is about 30 centimetres. And we found over a thousand individual finds. Um, pottery fragments, bronze artefacts, some tools, coins perhaps, some jewellery. And uh, in collaboration with the local museum and their archaeologists, they determined that we have several time periods represented here in the Ravna 3 tunnels. So we have Bronze Age, Roman, Medieval, um, maybe even Neolithic. Um, so what this tells us is that obviously with the date of the stalagmite, uh, we know that these cultures weren't responsible for the creation of the tunnels. Uh, but the, at least the Ravna 3 section has been reutilized through time, um, which is important fact because the critics of the project, um, initially in 2006 when Dr. Osman Lagic made his announcement, they were claiming that Dr. Sam was digging the tunnels himself. Uh, or that it was part of some, you know, medieval mine, even though there's nothing to mine inside the Ravna conglomerate. So if we're finding Roman artefacts, it, definitely Dr. Sam wasn't around in those days. Um, although there are gold mines in a nearby town, there is no gold in the Ravna conglomerate, so they weren't mining for that. And if you just look at the sort of tunnel arrangement, it makes no logical sense to excavate a mine in this way, especially because it's near surface. It would be much more efficient to strip mine it. So the, the critics of, of Dr. Sam and this discovery, by our finds in Ravna 3, it, it puts their arguments to bed. Um, so they need to come up with some new arguments. During the years, you were able to meet some of the experts in energy phenomena sound engineers, electrical engineers, physicists, and you have witnessed their measurements of so-called pyramid energies. Now, official archaeology, mainstream archaeologists, Egyptologists, geologists, they really never measure such phenomena on other pyramid sites. 
here it's different. So, yeah, when I first came in 2010, it was a, it was a great year to be here because we had three uh, independent researchers come in that summertime to measure the electromagnetic phenomena. And each of the three uh, scientists had different pieces of equipment. Some of them were professional um, manufactured bought equipment. Other people had custom built their own antennas and measuring devices. But what was important to see was that despite using different methods and different pieces of equipment, they were all coming to the same results, the same conclusions, that there is uh, a constant electromagnetic beam of energy being generated at the top of the pyramid and Ratnitsa tumulus. Now, had I not seen it for myself, I might have you know, doubted these statements, but uh, being here and seeing how those experiments were being conducted, not just in 2010, but repeatedly in the years that followed. Um, it's, it's something that obviously is genuinely there and uh, people should take note of it, scientists in academia, because the presence of this, it's not just by accident, this is by design. And so archeologists need to incorporate this into their conclusions as to what these structures purpose originally was. Archaeological Park Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun Foundation has been registered to do archaeological and scientific work here at the Bosnian Pyramid sites. But this project is much more than archaeology or even a number of scientific disciplines. We do have energy aspect, we do have healing aspect also. And I believe you've been able to witness a number of testimonials of people who go to the Ravne tunnels and come back with uh, much improved health. Well, I don't even have to take uh, other people's testimonials. I can speak from my own personal experience as well. Um, going inside the tunnels and working there inside them for an entire excavation season. I mean, I think in 2011 I spent almost the whole summer underground. And um, some days you come out absolutely exhausted, not from the physical exertion of the work, but because by breathing in those negative ions, your body is healing itself at an accelerated rate, which obviously takes a lot of energy out of the body in order to do that. And um, I, after spending a whole summer in the tunnels, I can say that m my physical and mental health absolutely improved. Now, I didn't have any serious um, illnesses, but as Dr. Sam has just said, people have come and they've had some really serious illnesses and they've come to the tunnels, they've drank the clear water inside the tunnels, they've breathed the pure air inside the tunnels. Anyone who says that isn't gonna be beneficial, you know, is, is not to be taken seriously. Of course, breathing negative ions, the, perfect clear uh, air is going to purify the body in some way. So do you think that uh, the health protection or self-healing aspect might be one of the main reasons why such construction complexes were built? I think there are many aspects um, to why these structures were built. <clears throat> health and well-being, obviously one of them also um, enhancing spiritual senses that we're all born with, we just haven't used them, um, and so they lay dormant in most of us. Um, also with all the chemicals and Wi-Fi and other electromagnetic smog that we're inundated with on a daily basis, this lowers our connectivity to our higher senses. But the pyramids were built as a machine with multiple purposes. Um, and so the work that we are doing is at the Bosnian Valley of the Pyramids. We're trying to have a multi sort of aspect of the pyramids. We're not just focusing on the archaeology or the physics 
uh, but the healing, the spiritual, the geological, archaeological, and all all archaeological sites, megalithic sites in the world, should one day um, start to conduct their investigations in a similar way, and only then will we start to truly understand who the people were and what were they thinking when they were building these sites. You mentioned the water, the water in the tunnels, mm. and a lot of stories about the water, about the healing aspect also, the vibration of the water. So yeah, I'm, I'm not, obviously I'm not a hydrologist um, or a chemist, but uh, I am aware of the studies by Dr. Yamato, who uh, took samples from the, the Ravna tunnels and conducted his experiments where he flash freezes them and then analyzes the crystal structure inside the water. Um, if you're familiar with his experiments, he's found that if you project negative emotions into the water, you get amorphous crystals, whereas if you project positive emotions, love, joy, you get wonderfully sym uh, symmetric geometric crystals. And uh, he took the tunnel water and he took also some municipal water from Visico and did his experiments um, with those two samples and he found similar results there. You had really bad crystal form in the municipal water. But then the Ravna water because it hasn't been through copper or lead pipes or plastic pipes because it's been percolating through the natural rocks. It's been in contact with the high concentration negative ions in the atmosphere. Um, very, as far as water goes from Dr. Umato's investigations, you can't beat it. It's, and also you can just taste it and it's beautiful. Looking into the future, what would you like to see as far as the equipment, instruments, and results? Okay. Well, <clears throat> someone told me the other day that uh, money makes the world go round. Unfortunately, I thought it was gravity. But yeah, the, the project um, is lacking in some pieces of equipment. Like uh, this year, we were after we finished the geodetic survey, of the Ravna tunnels, we're constantly excavating. So those tunnels are going to be constantly needed to be remapped. And because of the recent crisis, uh, lack of tourists, we weren't able to acquire the total station. This, um, all, all archeologists will agree that um, to conduct a reasonable archeological excavation on a megalithic site, a total station is a necessity. So one day, hopefully, we will have uh, that piece of equipment. Also, it will be really fantastic for uh, geophysics departments at universities to send their students here to practice um, whatever kind of subsurface surveys, whether it be electromagnetic resistivity, seismic, come to Visico and practice um, the field, field work. If you find something great, if you don't, well, you've just practiced anyway. So this is something that hopefully we will start to do because uh, I think if a geologist comes here for just a week, two weeks and has a look, they will have, like I, more questions than answers. You started working on the book? Yeah. <laughs> Slowly but surely, yeah. So yeah, my book, basically, um, I'm just going to um, put into word form some of the things that I've experienced here, some of my findings, more questions than answers is the common theme so far. Uh, this We're in the very early stages of investigations, so um, to make any sort of concrete conclusions at this point, uh, I'm not necessarily willing to do right now. You've been working with the international team of the scientists, researchers, volunteers, supporters. How would you describe that experience? 
Um, it's and, not. It's not just an ordinary job. No, it's not. And to be honest, that's another reason why I ended up here in the first place. No day is the same. You know, uh, I don't know um, who I'm going to meet, what I'm going to learn, uh, what adventure I'm going to go on. Uh, so yeah, it's for me, it's perfect. Um, I did have a stint in an office job, and where everyone I was surrounded by was the same day in, day out, Monday to Friday. The work was the same day in, day out. And uh, yeah, that categorically was not for me, whereas here is complete opposite, and this is this is perfect job environment for me. Now, with the Park Ravnit 2 and all different programs that we have, festivals and fairs and yogas and concerts and it's obviously something different and much more than just a regular archaeological project. It is. Um, you have to be open-minded uh, to, to be. I can understand why some closed-minded archaeologists, for example, would be offended by what they would see here. And mixing yoga with pyramid archaeology, you know, that's it's unheard of, really, in academic fields. But you will find that Many, many people who are interested in pyramids are also interested in these other aspects. And so we're combining them for a reason, because yoga teaches us about our uh, physical body and how it connects with the higher senses, you know, aligning the chakras and things like that. I have to say, I've not really given yoga a go in the park just yet, but it will be something that I might give a go in the next coming year or so. And uh, finally, message for the viewers? Uh, I would say do as I did and um, don't just read about the Bosnian pyramids on the internet. Really what you read on the internet it might give you a little bit of what's going on but until you experience it for yourself uh, reading what's happening here doesn't come close and um, you know if, it, if you come away critical of the pyramid hypothesis, that's fine because I guarantee that you will also uh, meet people and uh, have a great time. Anyway, the Bosnian people are awesome, the weather is fantastic in the summer, the food is fantastic. Um, but I think experiencing the energy of the place, and when I say energy, it, this is a word that gets overused a lot, but really, you, when you feel the energy of the place, um, you will be touching something that you won't generally feel normally um, when you're back at home. Great. Thanks a lot, Thank Richard. You. Thank you. Thank you.